Chapter 16, Fakers Open the door to your laboratory, the stranger ordered, and any other place you keep artifacts the diggers found here. Teresa stepped forward and asked for his credentials. What do you mean, the other man said haughtily. Our word is good enough. Nancy was already suspicious of them and their mission. She quietly drew back among the girls and went over to the camper. In the moonlight, she scraped the mud off the rear license plate and read the letters and numbers. She repeated them several times so she would not forget them, then returned to the group. Teresa was still arguing with the men. One of them was saying, Listen, lady, I could have this whole project stopped. Not one of you is from Illinois. You're trespassers. Teresa drew herself up very straight. We have permission to work here, she said with dignity. We certainly are not going to give you any of our fines. By this time, Art had come to Teresa's side. Want me to put these men off the place, he asked, and added in a whisper. With the girl's help, we could do it. Before Teresa had a chance to reply, the intruders started for the barn lab. They were stopped short as the whole group moved toward them. In a loud, clear voice, Bess shouted, If you dare try anything funny, George will use some judo on you. The men paused. Apparently, they thought George was a man and they wanted no part of a judo encounter. Besides, Art was ready to fight them also. The two men looked from one to another in the group. Defeat in their eyes, they exchanged glances. Then one said, Okay for now. We'll leave, but you can bet we'll be back. With this threat, they walked to the camper and got in. Teresa, her students, and the visitors watched in relief as the vehicle pulled away. When the chatter that followed died down, Nancy told Teresa that she had obtained the license number of the camper. Would you like me to go with you to Walmsley now in Clem's truck and report the incident to the state police? Teresa shook her head. It might be dangerous. Those men were scared away because there were so many of us, but on the road they might waylay just two people. Wait until morning. Perhaps you and Ned could borrow Art's motorcycle and make the report. How about it, Art? Glad to lend it, he said, and Nancy was delighted to see that he showed no sign of jealousy. Perhaps working closely with Julianne had made him realize what a fine girl she was, and he was becoming more interested in her. Teresa went on. I'd ask you to go, Art, but you'll need some sleep after standing guard here. I understand, he replied. The following morning, Ned arrived driving the motorcycle, and after breakfast, he and Nancy set off. When they arrived in town, she called state police headquarters and reported the incident of the previous night. I'm sure the men were phonies, she said. I visited Cairo a short time ago. The only museum I know of is the Victorian mansion, and there were no uniformed guards. We were taken around by a woman guide. The police captain agreed the men were imposters. I'll alert my force to watch for them, he promised. Nancy asked if any report had come in on Kit Cadle, alias Tom Wilson. Not a clue, he answered. Did you say you got the license number of the camper? When Nancy gave it to him, he said, Please stay there by that phone and I'll call you back. I'll get in touch with the license bureau and find out who owns the camper. While she and Ned were waiting, Clem Rucker drove up in his car. He greeted them warmly and asked how they made out the day before. Nancy told him, then asked, Do you know anything about that row of spearheads? The old farmer looked puzzled. Never heard tell of them. Where are they? When he was told, he shook his head. That sure is strange. At that moment, the telephone rang and Nancy answered. The state police captain was calling back. That camper was stolen, he reported. 
The officer went on to say he had also checked with the museum in Cairo. They had not sent anybody to get artifacts or skeletons. It was going to be a case of clear thievery, but you and the young archaeologists foiled their scheme. My men will make a search and try to pick up those imposters. While Nancy had been talking to the police, Ned had been telling Clem about the latest trouble at the dig. Somebody sure doesn't want you around here, the farmer remarked. But pay no attention to him. You scared him all the way before, you can do it again. As Clem rode off, Nancy told Ned about the camper having been stolen and that the men who had driven to the dig were phonies. Ned was thoughtful for a few seconds. Then he said, If those men who came to the dig last night are buddies of Kit Cadle, I'll bet he's in the area. I wonder if he moves around a lot or has some particular place where he holes up. Wouldn't it be great to find his hideout? Nancy asked. Big project. Ned answered. He and Nancy mounted the motorcycle and it roared off toward the dig. At one point, the road led through a rather thick copse. On a hunch, Nancy asked Ned to slow down. Let's see if anybody is hiding in there, she proposed. Ned cut down his speed while Nancy looked to the left and right for signs of a trampled area. She not only could see one, but in the distance, something shiny caught her eye. Ned, she exclaimed, please stop. He brought the motorcycle to a halt, turned off the motor and locked the engine. What is it? He asked. Look there, Nancy said quietly, among the trees. I see what you mean. Ned insisted upon going first, but told Nancy to stay close behind. As the couple advanced deep into the wooded area, they saw the stolen camper. You'd better stay out of sight while I investigate, Ned told Nancy. If those thieves are around, they may try to harm you. They didn't see me last night, so I could pretend I was just walking in here. No one was in sight, and a knock on the rear of the camper brought no response. Nancy climbed up to the driver's seat to see if she could find a clue. The keys are in the ignition, she called down. Ned, we'd better take them and phone the police. Ned agreed this was the thing to do. He pocketed the keys and the couple rode back to Walmsley. Nancy telephoned state police headquarters. The same officer whom she had talked to before answered. This is Nancy Drew again, she said. I found the camper in a patch of woods about five miles outside of Walmsley. It's on the right going toward the dig. The captain was astounded and said he would send two men over at once. You and your friend had better wait in Walmsley and meet them. The time went by quickly. When the officers arrived in a car, Nancy and Ned climbed aboard the motorcycle and led the way to the hidden spot. There was still no one around the camper. The troopers made a search for footprints but learned little. Finally, one said, I'll drive this camper into town. He told his partner to take the police car. Nancy and Ned walked back to the road and went off on the motorcycle. Everyone at the dig was eager to find out what they had learned about the intruders. The story amazed them. Bess murmured, To think that those horrible men were so near us all last night. Goodness only knows where they are now. Maybe very close. Bert and Dave, as well as George, had become intrigued with the art of digging. Teresa had explained to them how to go about it. After lunch, Nancy asked them if they would like to continue working there instead of searching for the hollow oak. Do you mind? George spoke up. Of course not, she answered. Bess wanted to make some special dessert for supper and begged to be excused from the sleuthing trip. Julianne spoke up. Art and I would love to go with you and Ned, she said. He'll be here any minute. Nancy said she thought this would be great. But deep in her heart, she wondered if it would be, or would a strained atmosphere develop. She did not reveal her thoughts, and directly after lunch, the four started off. 
Ned drove the old truck near the place where they had seen the spearheads. Wait here, Nancy requested. I want to run down that incline and see if the spearheads are still there. She found that they were, and was leaning more and more to the theory that Bob Snell had intended them to be a guide or signal. She returned to the others. Since the rope points in an easterly direction, let's go that way to look for Bob, Nancy suggested. Ned chuckled. This is the end of our smooth ride, he told Julianne and Art. From here on, expect some bruises. He turned off the road, went down the incline, and threw a field from which oats had been harvested. The truck bumped along. On the far side of the farmland, Ned turned left around a patch of thick woods through which the vehicle could not go. Nancy spotted an overgrown footpath. The four young people climbed out of the truck and followed it. Suddenly, they emerged at the edge of a huge rocky pit. It's an abandoned quarry, Ned remarked. And full of icky water, Julianne added. Nancy was looking toward a sign near the far end of the old quarry. She hurried over to see what it said. The words had been crudely painted. The young detective caught her breath as she read. Hollow Oak and its treasure at bottom of pit. End of chapter 16